Welcome everyone to another one of our AIM Learn Fast webinars. Uh, today we got kind of a special topic and I've been looking forward to, one that has been kind of tied in with some of our other recent webinars. Uh, we did a webinar um, just a, a couple of weeks ago with, uh, with Peter Krauss where he talked about uh, uh, installing data systems into your non-ECU cars, your, your vintage race cars and, and, and some, of those, uh, some of those cars that don't have that nice easy connection, which means we'd have to do a bunch of uh, sensor installs or tap into other, other sensors. And that generated a few questions and comments of, okay, sensors, uh, cool. Uh, and then there was lots of, you know, um, how about a few ideas of what that kind of looks like? What, what, what's, a, what's a good speed sensor install look like? Or what's a good oil pressure you know, sensor look like? What's some ideas on how to do that? Uh, so then we, uh, we, we generated this this um, this idea, we turned it into something. We started working with it, and David was uh, was kind enough to to help us put it all together. Um, we'll introduce David in just a moment. The only thing I'd like to talk about first is there's not going to be a ton of of um, 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 data that we're going to look at, so there's no sample data and and things like that that you might want to might might want to use, but um, or or download. But the um, um, the presentation is going to be pretty valuable. So I, I noticed in the chat box that we've already linked the presentation for those of you that uh, can just click on that live and grab that presentation. That presentation for those of you watching later on YouTube, it's uh, down in the in the description box. Everything we talked about being linked today will be linked down in the description box for the YouTube video as well. So keep that in mind. That presentation, I think this presentation will be helpful for uh, to to grab. And, uh, and and keep and uh, be able to take a look back at and say, okay, well, I remember seeing that installation. What's what's that thing look like with a bit, being able to zoom in on the picture and things like that. So keep that in mind. Uh, go ahead and grab that uh, presentation materials, and, and I think you're going to be okay. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. The uh, with the next slide, which is introducing David. David is. Um, this is his second um, video that he's worked with us with, his second we webinar. Um, enjoyed having you, David. Appreciate all the hard work that you put in to come into these. The uh, David's been around motorsports uh, a long time. I, I think we would call him a lifer, right? And uh, so this is what he does, and 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 he's very good at it, and um, good reputation in the industry. And and um, uh, thanks again, David, for coming. Give, give us a little bit about you and uh, give us a, a little bit of your background and kind of the, some of the stuff that you've done in the past. Well, thank you, Roger. I, I'm really happy uh, to be here again. And I want to thank everybody from AIM that's uh, made this uh, so easy. Um, as I'm, I am a lifer, no matter how you look at it. Uh, <laughs> I, I started when I was nine. And when every little kid wanted to be a fireman or a policeman, I wanted to be a race car driver. So, uh, you know, again, uh, as I grew up and got a driver's license, I did some water crossing and so on, but didn't have enough money to go real racing. So I started racing Grand Prix motorcycles. Uh, that was a whole lot of fun. Unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> as in most Grand Prix riders, uh, accidents can't be avoided. I uh, broke a collarbone and banged up a knee. <clears throat> so that kind of put an end to that. So anyways, a friend came home from California with a Winkle, Winkleman Formula Ford. And uh, so that's how it all kind of started. Um, worked with him for a year and then met a bunch of people and name got around. And as I said, the more you, you're in racing and the more you do a better job or a good job, the more opportunities come. So I've had opportunities with Formula Atlantics, Can-Am, Trans-Am, you know, pretty much anything that's got wheels on it and is in asphalt or dirt I've probably worked on. And uh, it, it's, it's been a lot of fun. And like I said, I've met a lot of people uh, that I'm still very good friends with. So that's about, you know, I'm, I'm kind of slowing down now. I'm, I'm on Medicare and, and uh, <laughs> so it, it's time to, uh, you know, I'm just kind of trying to do a lot less than I used to. The motorsports is a, it, it, it is a, uh, it is a lifestyle that, uh, uh, it gets a little harder for for some of us as we're getting a little older, right? Jumping over that wall and underneath cars in the rain, and and uh, oh. I, I, I hear you, I hear you. Uh, John, I remember John Block a while back uh, when he was uh, he one of the times he co-hosted with us. He uh, he talked about you know what he's uh, 
he's uh, decided that maybe it was a little time to slow down a little bit at the track side and, and, and do a lot of good from the other side, helping people building things, things like that. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, we all hit that point when it's uh, when our, yeah. when our bodies say it's maybe time to slow down just a tick. <laughs> and again, I, I, I kind of like the Swiss army knife of, of, of racing. Ah, there you go. Um, I've done, you know, no matter what it is at the track or at the shop, I'm either a machinist, a welder, you know, a fiberglass guy, a data guy, a data installer, whatever, whatever needs to be done. That's what I do. Make it happen. There you go. That's mm -hmm. uh, motorsports. Make it happen. Exactly. Okay. Let's, let's jump in and let's start to, let's start looking at a, a few different sensors. It's um, it, this really is just going to be a walk through a process, right? And, uh, and, and, and just share some ideas and uh, and hopefully you guys will even have some better ones and we can uh, we can we can continue to, to add them. What we're going to talk about is here's a list and it, this could have went uh, as deep as we wanted it to go. Uh, we only have about an hour, so it's uh, we, we kind of limit it to the common sensors in race cars, right? There are some other things, uh, as shown by the the last bullet. There, almost anything you want, we can add to a to a race car at this point, right? The sensors are are out there. They're 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 becoming the, either they are already or they they are becoming very quickly, you know, fairly reasonable in cost and and uh, the ability to install them. So, um, but we're going to kind of focus on the, the on the common ones and uh, uh, and take a look at some of them. Tell a few little stories behind some of them and um, and give you some ideas of, of things you ways to mount different things so we'll talk about that a little bit as we go the next slide Th this is um this is one that uh, a user i he, he i think he does follow the uh the webinars uh join us here in the webinars uh, and um and, and then we were chatting back and forth uh the fellow's name down in the lower left corner his name is jeff hoover and he he was getting his first aim aim system and he had um, we he had there you are thank you jeff i see you in the chat uh thanks for letting allowing us to to put this up there it's just a brilliant uh document and the way it did it that i wanted to share it and, and kind of have it lead into this this discussion he wanted to build the system and he kind of wanted to document it a little bit and and have a have it laid out so he kind of knew exactly what he needed and you know how he how he was going to install it make a plan you know as you say david you know, you know formulate the plan and then work the plan right and uh, That's correct. the uh, uh so 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 jeff put this together and i thought it was just a great um uh, great thing to share and show some of the sensors and a lot of these that are shown here we're going to actually chat about the, for the rest of the day so um i think it's just a, a good way of kind of planning your system as you uh, as you get ready to install it into a car is uh figure out what it is you want to kind of draw it up a little bit maybe it's uh, sometimes i just do them on the whiteboard as i'm working with a customer what do you want and yet and we draw it out draw the little lines between it and it helps us understand where do we need any sort of data hubs or channel expansions and where's the best place to put them and you know for the to minimize wiring and and, and all the different things which is what uh, what uh, jeff has done here with us so appreciate that jeff it's a it's a pretty cool little drawing and i, and I wanted to share it with everybody as we kind of got started so the um the first thing we're going to talk about, I'm going to kind of turn it over to David, and he's going to kind of you know work through, and we'll we'll sh we'll share some, we'll we'll look at um, uh, some of the some of the stuff that comes into the Q and A box over there. Tice, I see yours, and I think we're going to get to that one in just a moment. I think it's a good question, and let's uh, let's talk about it here in just a moment. But David, let's start off with uh, what some might think is the is the most uh, basic of sensors. You know, we almost all of us have something of them, but let's talk about different ways of mounting temperature sensors and why we might want to do that. Again, uh, this one is off one of the Sports 2000s that uh, I work on. Um, and again, it's, it's a common place to put it, which is in the upper radiator hose, because uh, that way you really do get an idea of what the head temperature is or what you know, the engine is doing. So if it starts to you know, uh, get hot, you're gonna see it. If it loses, you know, starts to go down, you know you have a problem, either you're losing water or uh, you know you have steam or whatever. So uh, again, it's it's what I call a health sensor. It's one of the most important ones because um, it really does save you uh, from spending a lot of money rebuilding your engine or you know worse uh, buying a new one. <laughs> so um, as again, this is a simple. Uh, you need to have somebody that knows how to weld. You get the bung and and have it welded into the pipe and install the sensor. And, uh, the other thing that Roger uh, pointed out to me that because uh, I just do it so often, I, I forget that I'm doing it, but I put this wrap around it. See it uh, here on the screen. 
you know, keep, keep the wires from getting chafed. Um, there's so much going on inside that small engine compartment that, uh, you know, I always make sure that I, I wrap them so they're protected. And also it helps for when you're tie wrapping that you don't over tighten the tie wraps and break the cables. And Tice had a question that uh, I'm going to go ahead and tie it into this one, uh, this, this screen capture, because we don't actually have a coolant pressure sensor or a mount type of a picture here. But uh, Tice has asked, any advice on mounting of the coolant pressure sensor? You do, where do I mount it, right? Uh, uh, which side? I like to have it on the pressure side personally, uh, you know, after the water pump heading into the, into the motor. But the, the biggest thing that I find that is important here is, uh, and ties into that pressure part, it, let's say this, this temperature sensor is in this coolant. Uh, I don't know if that's a return or an inline to the, to the, to the uh, <laughs> radiator, but, but uh, you can see that it's fairly high in the car. You can see the reflection here in the background. You can see David holding his phone as he's taking the picture, but yep. uh, fairly high. Uh, I've told this story in many, many seminars that I've done, but uh, we had a temperature sensor and we're going to think you see, we pick, we'll see a picture of it here in a couple in a spec Miata that we had. And I had the temperature sensor right at the top where I could see it and it was easy to get to. It was in the thermostat uh, housing on a, on a Miata. And, um, and we were at a race and, and we got a rock through the radiator at Thunder Hill uh, track in Northern California. And the, um, the water level, of course, started to go down as the as the as the water left the radiator, left the car, and my son was driving the car, and everything was uh, he was in there drafting around, and you know, spec me out as due, and uh, the temperature started to lower. The, the temperature, water temperature, as he's watching it, you know, went from from you know 200 down to 190, and then 185, and he's in the draft, and and it didn't make sense to him at the time, you know, a 16 year old out there running around, and then at some point the engine just melted, and so putting your temperature sensors and um, in an area that the water is is low in the system, you'll see the water temperature rise if there's a problem. As soon as the water comes off it, temperatures don't measure air temperature very well. They want they measure water temperature real well. Uh, right. Exactly. Which then take, took us to Tice's bigger picture question, which was a, is a coolant pressure. And uh, I, I, uh, from then on, we never went to, had a race car that we ran that uh, did not have a coolant pressure sis, sensor in it. And uh, where you place it, you know, you let, let's chat about that at some point. But, but uh, having that in there and knowing when that pinhole happened or that, that uh, head gasket was just starting to go and your, and your coolant pressure goes down. A very very valuable sensor, and I think that's worth uh, worth uh, worth worth considering. We don't. I do not think we have an example of that. So I thought during the water temperature it might be mm -hmm. a good time to talk about that. Okay, let's jump to the next slide. Here's a couple more, Dave. This is these are oil temperatures, and what do you see here? Okay, the one on the left is something that uh, you would see coming out of the oil pump, um, and you know towards the oil cooler. And what's good about this is that you actually get to see the actual temperature of what's probably your crankshaft and bearings uh, oil is seeing. Um, so again, there's, you put that one there. And then the second one on the right-hand side is uh, in an oil tank on a, uh, a, a Swift formula car. Uh, so we get to see the result of the oil going through the oil cooler and being in into a tank and being able to see what the oil now goes into the engine. So again, this kind of saves you your engine in that if you start to see excessive oil uh, temperature coming out of the oil pump and you start to see a lack of oil pressure uh, and you actually start to see rising temperatures in your oil tank, uh, there's a good chance that A, you got bearings going away or B, your oil cooler has plugged or collapsed or had some kind of catastrophe. So again, it's it's a big, big sensors to save you money because uh, nobody likes to blow up a motor. One, the expense, but two, the guy behind you isn't going to be very happy with it either because <laughs> you're going to uh, you know coat the track with oil and ruin it for everybody for you know one or two sessions. The um, uh, the, the question in the uh, that has been brought up a little bit, kind of related, and we'll, we'll we'll maybe talk about it under the pressure side a little bit as well, but. The uh, where do you put the oil temperature sensor? Some the, and that that really does depend, right? So we've had uh, we've had folks that'll put a, a temperature sensor in different spots, and of course you're going to have different different temperatures, right? If, if it's right where it comes out of the motor, 
it's at its hottest or different parts of the motor. If you were to tap in, it's going to be at different spots and you will see large numbers of degrees difference in, in those. So think out where you put your oil temperature or your water temperature sensors. The other thing that, uh, that we don't show here, I don't think, but uh, lots of folks will want to know how, how, how good is their radiator working or how, you know, for the water temperature side or the oil temperature side, how good is that cooler working? So we'll put one as it comes out of the motor and then it goes through the, the filter cooler and then it's coming back in and we want another temperature sensor there while we're developing the car, right? Uh, or, or maybe you leave it there forever. But uh, now, now you've got the two temperature sensors and you can compare that delta and see how effective your fans are, your, the airflow at speed, the airflow at low speeds, all those kind of things over those, uh, those devices. So temperature sensors, not just for one spot, uh, you know, there's sometimes you need to have multiples. Okay. Uh, oops, I put my past another one. There, there's another example of, a, of an oil temperature sensor. Um, I'll let David chat about it, but I'll just explain that this is a, uh, it's a spec Miata and it's right in the oil pan of the engine, right at the, um, you know, not even needing to be drilled and tapped for something. There's an option uh, to put something in there. What do you think about that one, David? Again, it's, uh, it's a pretty quick, easy uh, setup. Um, again, needing no extra tools or welding or anything. You just uh, find the correct fitting that fits in yours and wind the sensor in it. Uh, the drawback to this is, again, you're with an aluminum pan that you're into, you're actually, uh, when the oil pan gets heated up, you're reading that also. So you, you may not be getting the true range of your oil temperature. The second thing is, is that scares me is that if you go off track uh, and you bottom out on the oil pan, um, there's a good chance that uh, you're going to hit the sensor and again, create a mess. So yeah, we need to be a little careful with these because they're usually a very low point on the on the car, obviously. And this particular one, you can actually see the cross member there that uh, that, uh, that this one is slightly higher than that. So it, uh, you know, we're going to be okay here. But well, you just think about those things, obviously. But what's cool about it, as David said, here's one you, you didn't even have to drill and tap. It's just a, a, another fitting with an eighth inch NPT thread in it and uh, you're off and running. The, uh, the other thing that I would like to... Um, to chat about sometimes that camera goes out a little whack every once in a while uh, we'll get it back the other thing i'd like to chat about is sometimes sometimes you end up with a temperature sensor in in the um in a device in, in this oil pan or a you know some some sort of a device and it actually will start to measure the the um the, the temperature of the pan itself, right? So there will be heat transfer. So we gotta be a little careful where we actually place that sensor uh, to make sure that we're getting the temperature of the fluids and not the temperature of, uh, of the hardware that's mounted into. Okay. Tire temperatures, one that we've talked a little bit about here in the past, uh, but we've never shown too many mounts, but uh, what, what are we looking at here, David? Well, again, this is from uh, Matt Romanowski's 914, uh, a great example of what and, uh, and where and how, uh, as we always say on these things. Uh, the one on the left, I believe, is the one he has for the rear of the car, uh, the rear tire, because that basically just goes up and down. Uh, so you can, again, use three sensors to get the in, middle, and out. Uh, so again, same thing. It's great for, you know, checking your cornering temperatures, you know, hard cambers, whether your camber's right, whether your toe's right. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a good tool um, if you're, you know, struggling with uh, overheating tires and grip. The one on the right is from his front. Uh, he only uses one up there, which is because the tire is constantly turning, um, you know, lefts and rights and so on. Putting three on there is a nice thought, but you're going to find that uh, the, the out, outside and the inside data are constantly going to change drastically. Whereas if you keep it right in the middle, you're going to get a better idea of what the tire temperatures are doing. Uh, this in con conjunction with tire pressure, and that was something else that uh, Matt talked about and which I use is tire pressure sensors. Um, invaluable tool for, for setting the car up quickly when you don't get a lot of track time. A lot of the professional events like Trans Am and uh, Formula Atlantic and uh, Indy Lights and so, you only have a short amount of time, like th two practice sessions, a qualifier, and then the race. If, if you're not close to setup, 
you're gone. You're out, you're out of the ballpark. So, you know, any tool you in your toolbox, you can use to get you close that quickly. you got to use. Exactly. And, and a little bit more detail about these particular shots, uh, as David mentioned, the, you can see the three temperature sensors here. This one had me a little confused at first, but I, I saw these little holes and it's kind of pointing 90 degrees to the tire. But I think what this is a mountain, Matt, can maybe add a little bit here. But I think the mount is actually pointing out the bottom of this and shooting down to the center of that tire. So the, that one there, it, it kind of looks a little bit like maybe the uh, the sensor output was uh, was out the side of it, but it's it's really pointing down straight at the center of the tire. So, thank you. Um, okay, the uh, the next one. Let's see. Let's make that work. There we go. This was kind of a cool one. What do you see here, David? Again, uh, I've not done a whole lot of drag racing since uh, my teens, um, but I do follow it. And data, just like in everywhere else, has its place. So um, they have a single sensor pointed back to the rear tire. And there's a famous say, saying in drag racing is these guys want to get it up on the tire, which is, you know, you see when they accelerate, the tire grows uh, almost elongates. And they're now realizing that, you know, they, they need to take tire temperatures to see, you know, same thing for grip. It's what we're all searching for is to get the tire on the road and no slip. So they're using tire temperature sensors also to see you know, how, how hot the tire gets and able to compensate uh, by you know, either nitrogen in the tire or tire pressures so that they can get the maximum amount of grip. Yeah, it's, always pretty, about, it's always about the grip. Yeah, pretty cool the way they mounted it too. I, it, was so, it was so hard to see that, and, and all of these that are, that are, that, are uh, that the sensor is not the center of the picture. I drew a little red box around them. This one, I actually drew the red box and then I took a little, zoomed in on it just a little bit so you could see the sensor up here and I put it up in the upper corner. That's just a zoom of, of this piece, but the tire is on here. There's the other side is on and you can, uh, when that thing grows up, this thing's just getting an average of the, of the, of the face of that tire, giving them an idea. Kind of a, kind of a cool, uh, cool install. Thanks, Matt, for the for the imagery. The, uh, the here's another one. What's what are we looking at here? Well, this here is a Formula One car, the ultimate in uh, engineering and design. And you can see where he has uh, Rogers put the little square. Um, they have to make it so not only can it read the tire, but it's aerodynamically perfect, so it does not <laughs> cause any uh, you know uh, weird air patterns and disrupt all that wonderful downforce that they've created. So uh, this is pretty wild. I, uh, as I said, I, I, I've had the opportunity to uh, see these, and uh, it, it, it kind of takes you by surprise. You're really not, you know, you're, you're looking at the car because you want to see all the whiz bang stuff that they've designed. And this is just beyond cool. It yeah. just, as I said. And we'll go to, we'll take another look at it from the, the, from the other side. So you can kind of see it even a little bit better. Yep. You can see the eye now. And, and again, it's just aerodynamically perfect. And of course, this is probably a specialized sensor where it's not just sending out a, 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 a band, but it's actually grabbing the outer inner middle across a, a specific band, right? So they're getting mm -hmm. uh, temperatures across it, not just an average like, uh, you know, like, like some of the sensors we might, uh, might be using. So yeah. kind, of a, kind of a cool, cool technology. Uh, this, this is probably not what my, uh, my next race car sensor will look like. Not quite this fancy, right? But I uh, wanted to share some of, the, some of the really cool stuff too as we're doing this. Yeah. Yeah, as I said, you know, we we try to show everybody the the you know the basics, and then show whatever you know what what the elites have, what the what the people that yeah. have the, the proper amount of funding uh, can do. And like almost every other sensor that we're looking at that we use, I mean, in, in five years this may well be what we're using. So it's uh, you know the the, the price of uh, electronics is, just keeps getting uh, lower, and the and the the sensor gets uh, smaller mm -hmm. and easier to mount. So we may well be here very shortly. Uh, here is a, uh, you know, looking at here is some rotor temperatures, you know, now we're not looking at tire temperatures, but, you know, the brake temperatures themselves. What do you see here? Again, the left side is from the Formula One car. Um, the more you look at it, uh, you can see the sensor down at the bottom for the tire temperature. And, and again, they're using carbon, you know, rotors. Uh, we had these on the Atlantic cars and I'm telling you, uh, it, it, they're different. They're a lot different than uh, cast iron. You, uh, they, they, they do definitely work best when they're hot. 
So you've got to keep a lot of temperature into them. So again, it, it's a case of, uh, you know, learning. Uh, and the quickest way to learn is for the sensors. Also to point out is if you look at the top, there's another sensor up there. That is the speed sensor. Uh, that goes in and there's a wheel inside the hub uh, that has, you know, I, I won't be able to guess, but I'd say it had to have at least 20, uh, you know, either magnets or a, or a you know, some, some sort of way of uh, tracking revolution. So that's pretty trick too. Yeah. You know. And uh, on the right-hand side, what do we have? That, uh, that's off of Matt's 914, I believe. Um, it's, it's, you know, again, it's, if you have the outputs and you have the sensors, it's invaluable. Uh, same thing. You can start to see if, if, if you're starting to, you know, if your pedal's starting to get a little soft, you can look at your brake temperatures and be able to say, well, geez, my, something's going wrong in the right rear of the car. I'm going to keep an eye on it because if I don't and I lose the brake pedal, again, it's a costly mistake. So, you know, always good to have um, more sensors, more better. Exactly. And, and, and while we're not given the link to the data specifically, but if, uh, if somebody wants, uh, you know, Matt has been nice enough, uh, kind enough to share data. If you look back at any of the webinars that Matt has done that have anything to do with uh, tire temperatures and, and some of his other analysis webinars he's co-hosted with us, data from these rotor temperatures and the tire temperatures that we've shown, uh, that data is available. If, uh, if you can't find it, uh, uh, drop, me a, drop me a note and I will, uh, I will give you a link to it. Okay. Uh, Matt just put a really good blurb down there that he actually used it to, to figure out the uh, brake compounds. Uh, uh, that's, that's a, again, a, a great use for it. Um, Cause you, everybody knows you can get brake compound, you know, brakes in either hard to soft compounds. And again, you need to find out, this will make it easier to find out which one works best for your car. And you know, to me, I can't hardly see a difference here between this, this rotor on the left and this rotor on the right, right? They, 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 they look very similar. <laughs> Yeah, the, well, they're both round. Yeah, there, there you go. Yeah, Beyond that. Probably a little cheaper for this one on the right than the one on the left, I suppose. Yes, so, sir. Mm -hmm. Perfect. The uh, Let's jump into some pressure sensors. And, and here we're going to talk a little bit about, yeah, we're going to talk about sensors and the mounting of the sensors, but uh, we're also going to start to to talk a little bit about uh, some of the processes that are that we've used to mount it. Here's a couple great examples where we're mounting multiple sensors in one spot. Give us a little detail about this, David. Well, the left one has the uh, the older style VDO sensor. The guy has a, a block. Um, it's beautifully made, uh, yeah. nice and shiny and so on. He's, and so he has this oil pressure on top and it's either a, a, a temperature or a, for a, or a, a light or either, a, you know, an ECM pickup, uh, you know, for oil pressure back to, uh, to a fuel system car or whatever. So again, it's, it's to track uh how much you know pressure you have uh we were using the videos earlier in life uh they were a little fragile um and i found that when i mounted it like the one on the left uh especially if uh you, you're on a bumpy track or something the vibrations really they didn't last long let's put it that way um we'll have a better example of it later the one on the right is the newer um you know, oil pressure sensor that aim cells, they're bulletproof. Uh, I've taken all the videos out and put all these in. Uh, that also, you, you see the top sensor is for a uh, idiot light, a big red light on the dash, because sometimes the driver doesn't look down at the dash and see that he has little or no oil pressure. But if you put a big a stop light in the car and it drops below 15 pounds, he can't tell me he missed that one. So again, it's, it's cost effective, trying to save, uh, you know, it's easier to shut the motor off and, and you know, get towed in than uh, write a $10,000 check for a new motor. So, exactly. And you can see here that we're going into kind of a manifold right down here on the right picture, you can see where it taps into the engine block right into the oil galley mm -hmm. and uh, and grabbing the oil coming out here and, and, and pressurizing these two sensors. And on the one on the right, the Jeff's uh, image that Jeff Wasilko sh shared with me, you can see the oil 
oil pressures coming in from a line into this manifold here that's uh, been all polished up pretty on a spec Miata it comes in and then uh, you know fills these up and the, and the VDO pressure on the top is for the gauge and the, the one on the bottom uh, is, is heading to the ECU standard ECU probably a oil pressure cutoff or, or something to that effect. Jeff mentions in the chat that this uh, this pressure sensor is 10 years old and, uh, and wow. has lived and there's a uh, and the bigger reason for that is that that it's mounted over here on the on the firewall and not onto the super high vibration harmonics of, of the engine itself right so Correct. um yeah these these are these aren't quite uh, as good as these new sensors obviously but uh, but they had a you know they, they if mounted correctly they would have a pretty good uh, pretty good life to them as well and also just to let you know all those fittings that uh, on the right side i bought at home depot i spent i think a dollar 20 there you uh, go. to get all the fittings so yeah. or a plumbing supply or you know a, a automotive store but again you know it's the stuff's out there um and it doesn't take much to find it uh it, they're they're all pretty standard thread uh plumbing thread so I, again you know you you can do what you need to do um as as with that schematic you have to look at your where you're going to take your oil pressure from and decide what you need and lay it out and then go to the store buy what you need put it together and the other thing is the same thing not it's not just where you plummet but also the wiring uh as i said in a in, in formula cars and and the sports shoes and stuff we don't have a whole lot of room to to run wires um so you end up you know making uh putting six seven eight wires together in a loom and taking them out and you know again everything has to be a process and put in its right place or else you end up again a rat's nest and and if something goes wrong you start chasing your tail yeah. and uh, it, it's not fun finding that wire in a hurry ends up being more important we'll, we'll have a little bit of more of a chat about that here and uh, i think one of the slides coming up yes Another, um, uh, this happens to be uh, our personal spec me out of the one I was talking about when we first started here today. This is a, this is a video pressure sensor that I mounted uh, 10 years ago or so. Um, oh gosh, now it's more than that. It's uh, this was 2005, I think when we put this data system in, uh, mounted it with a hose that went, ran down to the engine block to, to mount that away from away from the engine vibration to make it live longer. Uh, as far as I know, this sensor is still working uh, even today, but I also mounted it in a, one of the Adele clamps with a, with a rubber coating. Uh, David, I think that's a, I think that uh, is another way to isolate out that, uh, those harmonics and try to help everything. That's correct. Uh, when we're using these in, uh, again, formula cars and stuff, um, we always ran them remote. We always packed them in, in foam and then tie wrapped them to a frame rail or, you know, something away from the motor uh, or, you know, the, the heavy vibration, uh, because that seemed to be the reason why these things would uh, fail. As you said, the engine harmonics uh, and just the constant shaking, um, you know, shook them apart. So you always try to take them, isolate them and then make sure you uh, insulate them. So this is a great picture and this is how I usually, you know, used to run these video sensors, uh, try to keep them, you know, shake free. Yeah, exactly. The, uh, the next one, I think this one was from Jeff as well. This is a, uh, this is a fuel pressure. We're kind of moving into the, some pressure sensors, uh, the pressure on the fuel side. Uh, what do you see here? This is kind of interesting. Well, when I first saw this, I, uh, I kind of, it took me back to, to a, a little bit because I hadn't seen that fitting uh, in, in quite some time. Uh, the last time I saw that was a uh, drag racer that used it as a nitrous setup. Um, but uh, this is beautiful. Um, again, you got fuel in, fuel out. You have your pressure sensor, and then you have your tap for when you have to give a sample of fuel. Simple, you know, basic, just again, functional. Just it's a wonderful, you know, it's a work of art, yeah. you know, it really is. It, it's uh, the design, the ease, the whole bit. It's just well done. This is what you, this is what you want to end up with. Uh, as I said, cost effective. And very, a very good solution for what he's after. It, uh, you know, maybe 
may, maybe it, it does harken back a little bit to the, that nitrous world. This is a, you know, uh, Jeff, are you doing something here with a, with some other fluids in there? Yeah, right uh -oh. now. <laughs> just, uh, just kidding. The, uh, yeah, the yellow bit is the top of the shock absorber is what uh, somebody was asking on the, on the side. The, um, let's see the next one. This one, um, let's, let's jump into maybe some brake, uh, brake pressure installs. I think we've got actually quite a few uh, signs of this. This is one that a lot of people struggle with getting uh, brake pressure sensors into a car that don't, that does not have those as part of the vehicle data system. So let's, uh, let's chat about this one. What are we looking at here? Well, again, this will say a standard, you know, production car uh, that's somebody's either is using an attract as a track car or it could be an MX-5 or whatever. And so again, um, they, you know, the banjo fitting that, that comes with the car, they took the original banjo out and bought an adapter so that now they can screw in this uh, pressure sensor. Again, simple. Uh, there, you try not to build the mountain, make it as simple as possible because simple is usually less uh, costly and more effective. And this again is a work of art. Um, it just, somebody took the time to think about what they wanted to do, was able to go out and get the, the, the prop, you know, source the fitting. And now you have it. it. It probably took less than 20 minutes to install uh, and then, you know, run the wire. It just, it just makes um, sense. Nice, clean install. Uh, this is off of Jeff's Spec Miata as well, but uh, ah. uh, he mentions in the, in the chat that Iron Canyon and Advanced Auto Sports, both AIM dealers, uh, both make this fitting right here. It replaces the standard banjo fitting, and then you end up being able to just plug in this uh, uh, eighth-inch yep. NPT pressure, yep. and, you're, and you're off and running without having to cut, uh, trim, you know, do any, any, any fabrication onto your, or your system at all. Very easy install. That's what, this is what I did with uh, our Spec Miata as well. Excellent. I've seen this fitting available at Pegasus and also a uh, place down in Mooresville. I can't, the name escapes me, BES something. Anyways, but yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is what you want to do. Uh, yep. If you're going to start hooking things up, um, try to keep it as stock as possible so that when and if you sell the car and the you want to go back to stock or close to because people kind of get the heebie-jeebies when they're buying uh, an X race car. So, uh, you know, um, something that this simple uh, works both ways. So, as I said, great installation. Everybody's always a little bit nervous of tapping into the brake system for good reason. And this is just a, it's just a way I, I think we, our next slide uh, talks about uh, installing for a dual master cylinder. You know, they were putting a sensor in the front pressure side and in the rear pressure side. And then I think we're going to show some, uh, some installs into the brake lines itself on the next slide. Let's talk a little bit about this one since David, this is your car. Yeah, this is uh, one of the Swiss uh, sports two thousands that yeah. I work on um, and kind of, you know, we're limited with space because you have a crush box. Uh, you have, as you can see, um, it, it's it's cramped, cramped quarters. So you really have <laughs> to uh, think about what you're doing before you do it. So as you see on the left-hand side, this is to the rear brakes. Um, so again, we have a fitting that goes into a steel line that goes front to back. Um, we have the sensor screwed into the front of it. Then uh, we have a line coming off the uh, the master cylinder and screwing into an adapter that goes into that same fitting. And then you can see on the right side the expansion uh, port the, that we both have. I still have two ports left over, uh, so there'll be more. And then the right side is uh, again. There's a fitting that I bought from Pegasus uh, that makes uh, you know the installation quick and easy. Put the sensor in. And, and same thing, it's just clean, simple, uh, easy to maintenance, you know, same thing. I wrapped them in that uh, isolation wrap so that they don't chafe uh, and so on. It just, just makes life a lot easier. And if you look down uh, on the bottom of the right, you'll see a little tag as I do with almost all my, uh, all my sensors and things, I tag them. Uh, there's a better view of one later, but again, this makes for when you're uh, hammering and, you know, things are going wrong and it's just the, you know, everybody's running around with their hair on fire. Uh, this sure makes uh, uh, finding things in a hurry. Um, same thing when, as we were talking about the rear of the car, 
uh, as I said, I have five AIM cables coming out of one place and for oil, water, you know, brake, uh, speed and so on. And so if, if, you're, if you're not labeled and somebody comes along and wants to help and disconnect something, uh, you're not there for yeah. 20 minutes, a half an hour trying to figure, re-plug everything into where you think it's supposed to go. So again, organization is the key, uh, you know, label everything. The, uh, I had a question come up in a couple different spots and we'll just chat about it really quickly. Okay. We, we, people plug, we're plugging in these speeds that, I'm sorry, these uh, brake pressure sensors. I'm gonna go back uh, to this one where, you know, the, the, the normal flow of, of, of fluid is coming out, turning and going down the system, right? And then we've got this extension out, it's pretty similar, much lower pressure. Uh, the Miata oil pressure sensor unit being mounted on the side, just down to a hose. I always was concerned about you know, how does this, how does it, how do we get the air out of this piece, right? If there's not a, a pressure, you know, some sort of a, a bleeder valve right here. I have, um, Time and time and time again, I, I have found that we, we standard bled it uh, on the oil pressure. I just left it cracked and we cranked over the motor till some of oil, uh, oil came up to the, towards the end, uh, you know, that foot, foot and a half long uh, braided steel line and then, and then tightened it up and, and ever after that, we never had any trouble with air in these lines. So bleeding did not seem to be a problem for anybody that I've ever chatted with after installing these type of things. So yeah. same thing with the, with the formula car. You just, uh, you know, have somebody put light pressure on the brake pedal and just crack it and you'll see the bubbles. And when the bubbles stop, it's done. Uh, yeah. And then you just go about bleeding the system the way you normally do. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. It ended up not being as bit, bit nearly, uh, it ended up not being a problem at all with, with those. So mm -hmm. um, here's one where we uh, were, were actually tapping into the brake lines themselves. Just did want to show a little bit of what these look like, uh, you know, just pretty standard fare. You can go to almost any, uh, you know, race car shop and we can get the, we can, you can purchase the lines and the flaring tools and, and, and put these together. Just, a, mm -hmm. uh, of course, the standard eighth inch NPT where, where they go into the brass fittings. I think this one was on Matt's, uh, Matt's 914. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, the big thing is, is that if you've never flared before uh, and you want to attempt this, and it's not hard, uh, my suggestion is, is uh, go by about a two foot length of uh, brake line and practice. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's, it's, you know, uh, it, it comes quickly. So, but again, the last thing you want to do is not flare properly and you get a leak at the worst time. So, uh, but you'll be able to see that because your brake pressure will be low. Yeah, 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 very quickly. And Matt tells me this is from a, a spec racer Ford. Oh, the, cool. um, and, and the second most important thing about uh, flaring that I found out fairly quickly too, was I went ahead and I'm all nervous and I'm wanting to get everything set up perfectly. And I start, you know, I got the little tool and I'm starting to flare it. And I, and I finally, and I pull it off and I look at it and I flare it a little more and I get it looking. At it. And then of course, you know what I did. Right. Yeah. I forgot to put the, put the nut on behind the flare. No. Uh, so, uh, so, so I had to cut it off, put the, put the, put the, furrow, the, 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 the nut back on and, and reflare it. So I think we've yep. all probably done that, uh, that uh, time or two as well. <laughs> Especially when you're in a hurry. That of course. Of way course. too often. Of or course. somebody's talking to you. Yeah. Oh, what are you doing? And, uh, yeah. 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 Oh, well, uh, but good practice. So, yes. and then why do we put on two, brake pressure sensors. Uh, yeah, David thought that maybe we could uh, show a, you know, a couple of, uh, of reasons we might uh, use that in time. What do we see in here, David? Okay, again, uh, Roger put up a really good example of what you know, a dash would look like. Um, so you have your front pressure, your rear pressure, and then your brake bias. Uh, again, take a Trans Am 2 car, which uh, I worked on a bit. You would start the race with 150 pounds of fuel. You know, so as the fuel burns off, you're constantly cranking the bias to change it. So again, what will happen is you'll go out and you'll practice or whatever. And again, if you don't remember to crank the fuel or the bias back, uh, it may spook the driver. So same thing in an endurance car, which I've done some endurance, you know, work for endurance teams is that, um, you know, they go out and they burn fuel and you have to, you know, they're constantly turning the brake pressure or brake bias to change as the car changes. Um, so again, you have to take really good notes 
and pay, you know, so that, you know, you're, when the car comes in, you take a look at your data or you take a look at the dash and say, okay, he finished the race uh, with two gallons of gas left and he's actually got more rear brake bias in it than he does front. Make the note of that. So now when you go fill it back up again, you crank it back up to your original starting spot. The other thing is, is that, um, you know, uh, if it's raining, um, you have a completely different brake bias. Well, if you haven't tested in the rain and you're not sure, you're gonna end up spending two or three laps getting your brake bias right. Whereas if you've taken good notes and you know what it's supposed to be, you can set the brake bias before you go out so again, you're not trying to fight back from the rear. You're at the front because somebody else forgot to do their brake bias. Yeah. It, it, this, this is to me, next to a, a, a throttle sensor or, or you know, speed sensors, um, aside from health, these are probably the most important sensors you can put in a car. Uh, just way, way too much information you can gather from these things. Exactly. And we and the, this particular percentage of, of uh, you know, front brake pressure percentage, it, it, it's a math channel that's stored on the logger. So this is in real time. Uh, the driver can you know, flip to a page that has it if, the, if it's an endurance race and wants to and wants to see where they're at or the, the way that most of us that are, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, sprint type racers, we, we, we've got our good notes. We know that, hey, the, you know, on this, the, this tire with this track or whatever, you know, 50, you know, 56% brake bias has, has always felt the best to me when I'm out there. So mm -hmm. we're sitting in the, in the, in the paddock area before we ever start and we new pads, everything is on the car. We yeah. can just sit there, push the button, you know, you know, crank a little bit of more front into it, push, you know, push the pedal a couple of times and get our brake bias, you know, pretty close right before we even head out. And that's a, that's just a great tip. You know, what we used to have to do is kind of put some pressure on it, look at the front, look at the rear. Uh, if we had the second sensor and then, you know, do the mental math. Yeah, okay, that's about that's about the fifty five percent that we're looking for, right? Yeah. Or have a calculator is sitting in with doing you know, so some math. Uh, not all of us are, are great at math, so uh, having it built into the to the data logger like this, uh, very very helpful. Yeah, it's, it, again, it, it makes your your post race or post session um, read, uh, you know, data session go over and and again, it's you could, it's a learning experience for the driver also. This is the biggest thing is this, you know, some people don't share this information with the driver. And, and to me, that's, that's insane. Uh, you know, again, you don't want to overload the driver with too much information, but if he's struggling, he's out there in the heat of battle and he doesn't know what's going on with the car, it could be as simple as he's running too much front or too much rear bias. A lot of people run too much front bias because they want to see the nose dip so they know that their brakes are working. Well, unfortunately, that starts to boil the fluid and then you start to get a faded pedal. So if you share this information with the driver saying, well, you know, you need to start doing this. I will remind you on the radio, but you have to do it by feel, but it's also, you know, you have to do it systematically. So it, it's, again, very important sensors. And another thing, uh, I saw a chat go by that talked about in internal of the logger, we can actually set that with a, a threshold value. So that 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 bias can move wickedly as just the noise in the sensor when it's around zero PSI. So what we do is we tell it, do not even start this math calculation until you're above 100 PSI. And that's what I, we've done here. And uh, so it sits there at zero. And then all of a sudden, when it uh, when it gets above 100 PSI or 80 or 200 or whatever number you pick, then all of a sudden the bias uh, calculation starts. So this this is uh, is not sitting there being very distracting. It is only giving you the numbers that you're after. So a very very handy tool. Uh, and here's what it would look like in the in in, a, in race studio if you have a couple of brake pressure sensors and create a math a brake bias math channel. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see here where we've done that same exact thing where we've we've told it to sit at 50% until the brake pressure gets above a certain level, and you can kind of see that that's probably at 100 psi because about at 100 is where that thing starts to pop up. So uh, same kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Again, we're not uh, deep go deep into analysis on this one, but just wanted to show some of you that uh, are tuning in for the first first few times where we haven't looked at analysis a lot. This is where you would use this in the analysis side of the data uh, post session. Yep, and just to let you know, this is again, we have a brake bias 
far. And if you look at uh, right where the uh, cursor is, um, you know, through most of it, the pressures are all the same, except for here. Uh, and if you can see that he was, when he was uh, shifting, downshifting, you know, and you have the oscillations uh, on the brake pedal, even, even though he's a left foot breaker, um, you, you will get different uh, pressures. So it, again, something to look at. Um, after I saw this, I actually went and uh, checked the brake bias bar to make sure that uh, it wasn't worn or you know the nut had come loose or whatever. But again, this helps you with maintenance uh, also. So just another one of those little tips and treasures that we're uncovering here. Yeah, yeah, and and you can see there the the bias was holding true, and then it kind of biased even more towards the front as he was coming off the brakes on that one and on this one. Mm -hmm. Another probably the bar maybe getting a little bit dry or or, or you know, you know, a little stickage happening there right there at the end. So little things like that we can see, and that's another reason why we want to, the two brake pressure sensors. Oops. Shock pots. What do you think about this shot, David? Oh, this is great. This is how we did it in the old days. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is not Bluetooth. This is definitely old school. Uh, I still use this. Um, again, uh, if I don't have shock pots and I'm trying to find out if uh, I have a travel problem, uh, again, you just bolt this on, send them out, and you know you get basic, you know, eyesight data. Uh, so it, it's it's a good understanding. Yeah, kind of funny. When I when I saw this image, it was like, you know, I, I think I have to include that in some way, right? Just a, a rod with a couple of tight O-rings, and it's just giving you a, a, a Minimax travel, right? We used to do it right on the shaft with with a wire tie, right? And um, But uh, with, with modern coilovers and some of the stuff, we can't necessarily get there. So this is a, kind of a cool little thing. So perfect. Let's go to some real shock pots though. And, uh, and, and chat, uh, we're, we're, we're getting a little short on time. So we'll kind of rush through them a little bit, but uh, there's a left and a right here, uh, David, what, yep. uh, what do you uh, see the, here? The left one's out of a uh, stock car or, or some kind of car. And as you can see, the shock pot is attached um, to the A arm and then to the frame. Uh, only bad thing with this is it, yeah, you'll get your shock theta, but you have to also figure out that you're gonna to have to calculate a motion ratio. Whereas the one on the right is actually attached to the shock. Uh, makes life simple. Um, what you're reading is what you're, what you're seeing. So uh, it, it's pr preferably if this is how you wanna do it. Yeah, if you have the if you have the ability to mount your shock uh, sensor right to the shock bolt, as the one here on the right, uh, well, it appears to be maybe a stock car or something. Uh, mm -hmm. Boy, I lo love to do it. Uh, the one here on the left is an MX-5 Cup car. Yeah. It, it, there's no way of mounting that uh, that shock pot there, so we had to mount it on the on the lower control arm. And then uh, then you have to do more math to get to to your final result, just like you were saying. The right one looks like it's out of a Trans Am car. Trans Am car, perfect, <laughs> perfect. The um, um, but it, just a couple of different ways to mount them. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, here we just found some nice little clamps. This happens to be a, our, our personal MX-5 cup car that uh, a couple of little clamps made a made a all bolt-on stuff, then found a, a hole up here at the top where we could make a little uh, aluminum bracket and a little standoff and uh, and it was all bolt-on. So it uh, ended up being a very, very quick and easy move them from car to car and do different things with them. So. Uh, the next one is more formula car, uh, you know, looking. Uh, give us a little idea what you're, what you're seeing here, David. On the left-hand side is, is actually the, the bell crank um, for either the, probably the front suspension. And the, the pot itself is missing. But the reason why I chose this is so people could see the gear and how the thing works. And then when you go to the right side, you actually see how they're bolted on and how they work. Um, also on the, le the left side picture, there's a, you got a bonus shot. Uh, there's a load sensor there that is uh, we used for you know Atlantics and and uh, Indy light cars. I'm sure they used them in Indy. And and again, it's for high downforce cars. You want to know how much pressure or you know weight uh, is being applied so that you can you know because you start letting air underneath a uh, ground effects car, bad things happen. So <laughs> you really need to uh, keep an eye on you know the weights. Um, but again, these. The shock sensors here, uh, we don't use them just uh, for shock pots. We actually use them to calibrate them so we can calculate ride height uh, as, you're, as you're driving. Um, so same thing, not only can we set the shocks here, but we can keep an eye on you know, what the car is doing as far as height. 
So yeah. if we start to um, get uh, too much lift in the rear or, you know, so on and so forth, it, it's, it's just, again, science. And once we know, once we know the right height of each individual corner, and then all, all of a sudden roll, pitch, yaw, all of that stuff is, is easily calculated from the, from those values. So yep. very, very, very cool and very small. I, I, I had not seen this. I had to actually chat with David a little bit about more about this, but the, the sensor while it bolted on here was just a, basically a, a pinion, right? And then you had this mm -hmm. rack that was toothed. And as this, as this middle piece, uh, you know, as, as the sensor was moving with the, the gold, uh, cantilever piece, right? This the, it was just rolling along here and giving those values, and you can kind of see it, how it works here. I'd not seen a sensor that was quite like that, so I thought this was very interesting. Uh, Reynard IndyCars was thinking that yeah. was a front bell crank. Yeah. Matt was saying in the chat, so pretty cool, pretty uh, pretty interesting stuff. They all, I mean, if you look at almost any of the yeah. Continentals, uh, you know, most of the newer car Formula cars, it's it's pretty much they all use pretty close to the same bell crank. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. And again, we're not going to get into a ton of the, the data itself, but it, it, this one was kind of an interesting shot uh, from some data that you had that uh, all of a sudden you, it's shock data, it's suspension analysis, and you can see that the, the three of them you have the t kind of standard looking histograms. That one on the right, lower right, is uh, looks like a problem. Well, uh, I included this just for this reason. Um, as as Roger and I talked about, what happened here with this one, we're at Sebring and we're doing a quick spring change. And unfortunately, the person that was helping us um, helped us a little too much and, and actually broke the sensor and didn't tell us. Uh, but as Roger and I spoke about this, you'll also see this similar or somewhat similar if you have a, a bent shaft or if there's something internally wrong with the shock. So, you know, same thing. It's, it's nice to have, uh, you know, if you've got a, a poor handling car and you don't know why, uh, you know, strapping on a set of uh, shock sensors will, will tell you uh, instantly what, what corner is giving you the problem and why. Yeah, whenever you see things not moving very much, oh, this is just a, a whole bunch of data from the low speed, uh, spending a lot of time in the low speed area or not moving at all. Uh, and and at Sebring, that uh, yeah, clearly this is a problem, right? <laughs> yes. Sebring's not a, uh, you don't see a ton of low speed shock uh, shaft speeds at uh, at Sebring. <laughs> and, and I think our final one, uh, and we are getting kind of close on time, but uh, yeah. st some steering sensors, right? So the, uh, and uh, Kyle had a question uh, uh, up there, we'll try to jump into that, Kyle, here just a second. Now that we're at this, I know it's been sitting there for quite some time. Um, this is a Spec Miata uh, 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 personal car, again, that uh, that we threw a, a rotary potentiometer on the steering. Uh, probably the cheapest solution, the easiest uh, uh, to find and, and purchase. A uh, you know, little bit of mounting uh, to get that cog belt to be uh, aligned and tight and, and, and all of that. Do you have anything to kind of add on on that one? Um, I've used these. Uh, the only thing that I don't like about them is that when the belts need to be replaced, it's, uh, you know, you've got to take a whole lot apart, exactly. but they are accurate and they work quite well. Uh, as I said, I've, I've used them a lot. Um, in fact, probably two thirds of my uh, Sports 2000 and Formula cars all run this setup. And typically this sensor is, I mean, they, we make different ones at, uh, at AIM, but uh, yeah, they, uh, they typically are like a 10 turn sensor. So you can make sure the, the, the one biggest problem I've found with these is guys uh, do not center that steering, that sensor before they put it on. And if you overturn that sensor, it just pops the internal, you know, out of it and, and, uh, and then you have a problem. So if you're ever going to mount one of these, make sure you, you turn it all the one, one way, count the turns the other way and go back to the center, center your steering rack, and then put the sensor on. Yep. You're going to be much better off. Um, string pots are a very, very popular way of doing uh, uh, steering sensors. What do you see here real quickly? Uh, again, there's two examples. Uh, one were on the left-hand side that somebody uh, took a lot of time and, uh, you know, basically made a beautiful bracket and used a, uh, a bolt to hold the eyelet in. And, you know, it, the string comes straight out of the pot, which is very important because, again, this is basically dental floss. Uh, under uh, spring tension. So if you don't have them straight in and out, um, the chances of the string breaking is pretty good. Let's put it that way, above average. 
the one on the right um, looks like something that I, I would do at the racetrack. Uh, somebody would hand me a sensor and say, look, we need this bolted on. So I would go find a piece of aluminum in the trailer, make a couple bends to it, get a hose clamp, and, you know, there you have it. Uh, as we see, the string is not straight out, so it does have a little bit of a uh, tension to it, yeah. and it would be something that I would try to fix when I got back to the shop. But unfortunately, you can look at some of the cars I've worked on and the things that I've done at the track, and they're still the same way seven, eight years later. Because they continue to work. The other thing I would do with string pots is make sure, you, as best you can, you can't always do it, but uh, is keep this the, the length of string as short as possible in, in the free air, right? Uh, right? You end up with with a lot of room there and all the harmonics of the car or wind coming past yep. can actually, you know, there's a lot of pressure on here, but uh, you can get you can get a lot of wind that uh, will, will start to pull these away and give you, and of course, when it pulls, the wind pulls it, it's pulling more string out and you're actually getting that as part of the electronics. So be very, mm -hmm. very careful. I've had a couple of guys that tried uh, tried to put some string potentiometers on suspension and they put it in the back and now they have like a foot of string oh, yeah. hanging out when the car is at full droop and the the numbers were just uh, it was virtually unusable didn't so, work yeah been there exactly. done that yeah uh, here's a couple of steering sensors that uh we, we've looked at uh, cogged wheels or, or rotary pots and then we looked at string pots and here's a couple of linear pots on steering yep. the one on the left is from a formula car uh david arkin uh, did a very beautiful job of uh, installing this. Um, and again, the one on the right is from an off-road truck uh, that uh, somebody has taken the, the crash shields off so we could get a good look at it. Uh, same thing. Um, very well done. Very accurate. So uh, as I said, it's, it's you know, just, just a, a, another way of, of skinning that cat. So, uh, you know, however it takes. Yeah. And uh, to kind of go back to some of the stuff we talked about earlier, look at the, the beautiful job of, uh, of wiring that in and isolating and, and, and wire tying everything all up nice. That means it'll be a good long life installation. Uh, very, mm -hmm. very nicely done, David. Uh, and, then, and then the steering data analysis, right? You, you, again, we're not going to spend any real time on this, but you can see how the data ends up looking in the end. Yeah, plain and simple. I mean, it's good to see if you're getting towards the tire G. Uh, again, uh, if you're having steering issues, uh, you can look at this along with throttle and see if it's throttle induced or, you know, same thing if the guy is sawing at the wheel and you now you have to figure out whether it's the driver or the, there's actually a problem with the car. So again, just easy, easy thing to uh, look at and be able to listen to the driver and go to the data. Let me see what the next, uh, the, the, the um, um, Kyle did talk about his question from earlier was, was uh, steering angle finally graduated. In other words, this sensor has only so much resolution, right? Mm -hmm. And if you, if you mount any sensor, uh, the point he is getting at is if you mount that sensor where you're that, that, that turn sensor that I talked about has three, you know, 10 turns, right? Uh, and it's a fairly inexpensive sensor. So that resolution, and now you're only working in that sensor is only moving, uh, you know, one, one hundredth of, of its travel. We're, the resolution of the electronic side of it is 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 fairly large, and we can see, you know, maybe some noise in there. The, it, it again, you're you're taking your sensor. It's just like any pressure sensor. You don't want to use a zero to two thousand for a, a five psi, you know, carburetor fuel you know, uh, fuel mm -hmm. fuel pressure sensor. You want to get a sensor that is in the range. That takes care of a lot of that resolution issue. If we want to, if we if if we use something like this, we want to mount that sensor in a way that it uses most of its travel or you know, uh, pressure range or whatever to get the best, uh, the best data out of it? I think that's a, a, good, a good question. Okay, um, we're, we're, we are just a little bit over. We'll probably only be about another five minutes or so. Um, okay. here, here's, a, here's a throttle position sensor using a rotary pot. Yep, quick, uh, easy thing for carbureted cars. Uh, basically you weld a, uh, a bolt onto a nut uh, for the carburetor, uh, put a little uh, uh, um, nylon tubing between it. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite accurate and quite easy and very cost effective. Pots are about 10 bucks for a good board pot. Uh, as I said, uh, I would suggest welding and not brazing. Um, braze seems to fall apart. So uh, <laughs> that's the only tip there. But again, if you've got a carbureted car, I've used this on, uh, you know, V8s, uh, Holley carburetors. So again, this is off of a two liter Pinto motor. So pretty easy. So the uh, and then uh, then I think 
this one I think was from Matt and uh, I think we got two more slides, but this one I thought I not ever seen this again. We all learn everything every day, right? But this has a rotary pot, just a swing arm rotary pot. And then as the, as the throttle position is moving, it's just taking this bolt and pushing against the little arm. And, yep. uh, and and getting a signal and and we're getting throttle position out of that. I thought that was brilliant. I, I thought yes. that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. A great little solution for something that uh, sometimes is a little bit uh, is hard to to figure out. Oops. And then the the last one on the throttle positions is a, is a string potentiometer on the throttle position itself. Mm -hmm. And this is just you know we've seen close up pictures of the steering with that string pot mounted. Here's one on a Spec Miata. This is our own personal car. Um, just a little aluminum plate onto this, these mount bolts here, and then the string pot coming straight down to the to the bell crank for the throttle. Pretty uh, pretty easy way. I the last three shots we showed with this one, uh, this one uh, not connect, not a full time connection, and then this one being a rubber connection uh, to the to the throttle. I think is such a a good idea. I, I the uh, certainly we've done them and certainly we're, we'll continue to do them. But I loved in race car situations uh, that I did not have a direct connection where a sensor could end up fouling the throttle position mm -hmm. or, or hanging up and, and, and creating a full throttle stuck open position problem with the string pot and, and, and uh, some of the other ones we've looked at, uh, you know, that's that's minimized. And I think that's a, a good idea. What else do you see there, David? Anything you'd like to add? Again, uh, just on the left side, uh, you labeled your, uh, your your string pot, which right. is again a, a great picture of how you do it. Yeah, there's a you, we can get these uh, these label makers now. I, I I use one that's a little bit high end, maybe in the elect electrical in, uh, electricians industry where they actually have a, a cloth you know uh, a piece, and I I label every one of my connections, and then I put that on there. You can see TPS there, and then I put a piece of clear shrink wrap over it, mm -hmm. so it stays there forever. Even if you get some oil on it, you can wipe it off. And then when I'm searching underneath the hood, and I'm trying to figure out I, I need to replace that sensor really quick underneath the dash when we're laying on our back, and we've got you know, five sensors, uh, extension cables head out from there. Every connection between here and the logger also says TPS on, on both sides. And it just makes it easier to, to find that sensor and, and replace that cable if, if, if need be really quickly. Correct. So very, very important to me. And on the off-road truck that we that we seen a, a few shots from, you know, or if it's going to be a race car that this data system and there's an extension cable that runs front to back, it's going to be in there for a while. Uh, when I have this connector that's the, the between the two, if I have an ex, a connection halfway back, I put the, the, the symbol, the, the tag on it, and then I put the clear shrink wrap over both and shrink wrap it. So that connector is, is fairly waterproof and certainly is not going to vibrate apart ever, even if rocks or mud and you know, hmm. arms from people you know, trying to adjust some things really quickly, you're never going to knock that apart if you shrink wrapped the connections as well. And I like to do them in clear, just to make it where I can see what's underneath there. So that's just another little bit of a tip. The um, uh, we're, we are running actually pretty long, yep. so we'll, we'll run through these really quickly. This is yep. speed sensors, and it's just a uh, uh, a CV joint mount where the we've got a magnetic type uh, uh, pickup on the sensor itself, and we mount some magnets on the CV joints, and you can uh, you can grab that signal as that spins around. Boom! You end up with the pulses, and we end up with with speed traces. So pretty uh, pretty interesting. Oops. Here's another way of doing it on CV joints. Uh, this one has a, uh, a magnetic picture here. The, the picture, I'm sure, is not lining this up correctly. A little bit of play with the imagery. But um, this CV joint over here, let's talk about the, the, there are two different speed sensors. This one's picking up on a reluctant wheel with, okay. with metal teeth. We can, you can either do them with magnets or you can do them with, uh, with, yep. with metal, with a, fer ferrous metal of some sort, right? Yep. Inductive, uh, con I can't pronounce that word, contract trinix. Tr 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 yeah, <laughs> concentric. Uh, yeah, um, the uh, anyways, uh, re yeah. reluctor wheel where we got the metal pieces and yeah. uh, pick up or the me or the magnetic type. Mm -hmm. And then watch your uh, watch your gaps when you do that. The, these type here are really really thin, and you have to worry about how tall the tooth is. And uh, this sensor has to be fairly close on the magnetic aim sensors. You know, it's it's like ten millimeters is the yes. air gap that needs to be on those. So make make sure you keep uh, keep that in mind. And, and and finally, here's one on a drive shaft. This, this is our spec Miata that, uh, that we've used a lot of pictures from since I had them. But uh, just a little mount. Uh, you can see where I, I spun it around and I made some marks with a, with a, with a Sharpie. And then I just glued on four uh, um, 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 you know, uh, magnets, uh, yep. uh, rare earth magnets on there. And then I had four 
sensors. In case one flew off, I could always uh, do the math a little bit different later and still get speed. So, and I wasn't, I was afraid that the magnets might fly off. So I, uh, I put on four of them, but even one magnet would have worked, would, would have worked fine. So, and, uh, and this is kind of an interesting shot. I'd like to take just a, you know, 30 seconds to talk about this, uh, the speed trace that we're seeing. Again, um, basically the, with the two, two speed sensors on your drive wheels, uh, it's easy to pick up wheel spin. And Roger did a wonderful job putting a math channel in there, simple one that uh, shows our, uh, our, you know, the, the actual wheel speed and the sp we're getting tire slip. If we go to the next uh, slide, uh, we kind of bolt down to it. And you can see that uh, when we start to get the wheel speed or wheel spin, it's throttle induced. He got uh, into the throttle a little too quickly or a little too hard. And uh, as again, it's just, it's another tool to be able for one driver coaching and two, um, if you have a suspension issue, uh, maybe the car's not, you're running too stiff of a uh, sway bar and not letting the car roll over or you got too much compression in the rear shock. So again, just an easy way of uh, diagnosing a problem. Or a, or a limited slip differential going bad, right? Uh, oh, yeah. And the math channel, we, you can do these as simple or as complex as you like. This one here is strictly just mile per hour difference between the two. It's just the rear speed and minus the, I'm sorry, the right speed versus the left speed on the across the rear end. And, mm -hmm. and it's just miles per hour. You could do percentages of slip. You, you can do them any way you want. But uh, I tend to go really basic on the. I just need to see where this difference is, right? And, yep. and, and to take my eye and say, this is an area we need to look at. Okay. As we kind of close this out, I, I'm sorry we had to rush through a little bit there at the end, but um, the um, there's a there's a page that I think a lot of people don't uh, don't visit all that often, and I just want to bring it to to everybody's attention. I we put put a link into the into the chat box, but there's a sensor page on the AIM website, and um, here's the link, and it'll be in the PDF where you can click on it and and go straight there. But it's information on the AIM Sports site where uh, we talk about. Uh, uh, temperature sensors, pressure, position, speed, beacon, and RPM sensors are all stacked on top. I've just used the one example for the position sensors. What's kind of cool about this is it gives us the, of course, the name of the sensor, and then it, uh, then it you know, gives us a hint of where we typically would use it, uh, uh, a little bit of detail about it, what, where would we use it, uh, the length of the cable, maybe even the, 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 the connector types, things like that, the part number. And then you come over here and you get an image by clicking on it. It goes up to a full size image. And, and more very important to a lot of people is these data sheets. It gives us all the pinouts, the length of the cables, the, the sizes, the, the travel, all, that, all of those kind of things are in these data sheets. And they're just available for you to click on and, 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 and a PDF shows up for you. Um, and then the, the last piece says, of course, when you install a sensor, you need to you need to, to configure it in the day log. You'd need to tell that channel you know seven, this is what's coming at it uh, in here and then calibrate it, right? In some cases, especially with position sensors, it needs calibration. Over here, it tells us how to do that if you're using a late model hardware uh, in Ray Studio 3, or if you have an older piece of hardware and you're doing it in Ray Studio 2. By clicking on these, there's a document that comes up and walks you through the steps of, of configuration and calibration if it needs it. A lot of you know temperatures and pressures don't need any calibration, obviously. But it does tell you what sensor to what sensor type to pick, and then if it needs calibration, it's in there as well. So very, very powerful page that I think a lot of people don't know is there. And I just wanted to take a minute to, to talk about that and kind of point out what it looks like. Okay. The, um, this one, like the, the, David has done a great job putting, bringing together a lot of you um, um, uh, folks in the, that watch these lives uh, sent us, uh, sent us screens, uh, you know, images of, of sensors. And I appreciate that. Thank you all for doing that. Uh, this is being recorded and obviously going out onto YouTube as fast as we can. The, uh, so we currently, this will be, uh, um, video number 147 that we have up on our on our YouTube site. So uh, if, um, if those of you that watch this, if we went through it a little bit quick, you've got the presentation materials the, that you can go take a look at. Or if you're watching this on YouTube later, the uh, the document that uh, that were, were the presentation document with all of the images are, are in there as well down in the description box below. Uh, but uh, visit us up on, on the YouTube site where all of our webinars are. If you're, if you're watching this as the first one, go back and watch some of the other ones we've done. There's uh, lots of really, really cool information there. 
the um, AIM is a customer support company that uh, happens to sell racing electronics, as I like to say. Um, we're out there at racetracks every single weekend during the week. Uh, certainly, you can give, it, give us a call at the 800 number there. Uh, if you have any questions, if you need anything uh, answered, any, uh, any technical kind of stuff, make sure you give us a holler. Let us, uh, let us help you. That's what we'd like to do. Um, next, next week, we're going to have a... We're going to step back into the into the CAN bus area. We've been chatting and we've been uh, kind of working in some of the folks that have been uh, uh, attending live uh, with us here in in the chats uh, uh, and chatting back and forth. And Jeff is one of those guys. I've known Jeff for quite some time, but but uh, Jeff is going to join us and talk about practical CAN bus. We've uh, had a couple of uh, webinars about this. We've, we've talked about these tire pressure monitoring kits that you have to add. So what we're gonna do on this one is, is not necessarily dig in too deeply into what is CAN bus and how exactly does it work? Although we'll, 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 we'll briefly touch on that, but it's more of a practical thing. You've got an AIM device in your car, you've got an AIM logger and you wanna add one of these. What, what are the basic steps I need to be able to add a CAN device in? So it, it's not gonna be super deep as, as far as technical, but it's gonna be very, very helpful for those of you that wanna add some sort of an external CAN device into your AIM, AIM system. And we'll map out kind of how it works a little bit as well. Jeff's going to come in and, and, and co-host it with that, uh, along with uh, what I like to call AIM Sports Super Tech. Robbie, Robbie Yeoman is going to be, uh, is going to be joining us as well mm -hmm. uh, to talk about that topic uh, a week from today, March 2nd on Tuesday, and, uh, and lo really looking forward to that one. That will be a good time. So the, um, um, I appreciate it. Here's some contact information. If you want to chat with uh, David or myself about anything that we've talked about today, uh, my email address is there, Roger at AIM Sports. Uh, give me a holler anytime you'd like. David, is uh, his email address is right there from uh, D Free Trackside Service. David, I just want to say uh, thanks for thanks for doing this. It's uh, I know it's always a lot of work and it's uh, uh, it adds to your already busy schedule. But um, is there anything else you'd like to kind of add to uh, to kind of end this one up for us? I've been watching these all along and to be part of it is very special to me. And again, thank you, Roger, for inviting me. And again, thank everybody at AIM. Uh, keep up the great work. And as I said, if everybody, uh, if everybody did what AIM does in the racing community, it'd make racing a whole lot more fun. There's just, they just go out of their way to help you. And as I said, these webinars are a prime example of them going out of their way to help. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate it. For those of you who are still watching live or if you're watching this later on YouTube, we, uh, I would like to put out a call for any, um, any, any topics you'd like. We've got a few, uh, obviously, in the can ready to kind of go ready, ready to present uh, in our weekly webinars, but uh, looking for more um, um, webinar-focused topics, please send those to me. And the other one that I'd I, I will announce real quickly here while we're there is I'm, I'm thinking of doing one maybe in three or four weeks where we bring in some, and I've got some names in mind, but if you're interested and in, in, uh, uh, those of you watching live, uh, or, uh, if you'd like to come in, some of the people that are here every week live uh, from all around, the, all around the world, frankly, uh, I would like to bring on you know, some of you individually and, and maybe three or four during, a, during the hour and chat about what, uh, you know, some of the stuff that you, that you do in data and what you've learned from the webinars and stuff like that. So some of you that are, uh, watching live and watch live all the time. If you'd like to join me for one of these, uh, get, a, get in touch with me at my email address below. I would love to, um, to um, bring, bring some of you on and, and figure out uh, what you're doing uh, uh, outside of what we're watching here. Uh, I think that would be kind of a cool thing for everybody to watch. So appreciate it. Thanks everybody for coming. Uh, look forward to seeing everybody uh, next week and I hope everybody has a good safe week. Talk to you guys next week. Bye now.